Hello everybody, is everyone alright? Yes, I am alright, thank you. My name is Ben, this is Doom Antidote, <laughs> and uh, this month I read... Uh, oh, seven books! Seven books! Look how um, thick they are. <laughs> So yeah, I hope everyone is alright. Um, I hope everyone is as well as they can be in the present circumstances. Um, if you are, then that's great. If you're not as well as you can be, then screw them. You know what I mean? Screw them! So this month on Doom Antidote, we, um, we hit a milestone. We reached 3,000 subscribers, which is fairly ridiculous, um, uh, but also fairly quite nice. <laughs> fairly quite nice. So yeah, I'm very, very grateful. If you've subscribed to this channel, I'm very grateful because it is... A um, silly run-of-the-mill booktube channel, um, but I'm glad that uh, you've subscribed, and I'm glad that uh, people watch. It's very nice. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. At the end of this video, I'm going to be doing some shout-outs um, to channels which I enjoy. So uh, stick around for that. Um, but um, for now, let's just get on with it. Okay, so I'm actually going to start. So we've got seven books to. Seven books to get through. I'm going to start with the book that I finished last. So I finished this this morning, and I'm starting with this one because it relates to the first book that I read. Um, right, okay, so the first book that I'm going to talk about is this. Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. By Daniel Defoe. Robinson Crusoe. Oh, here we go. Here he is. Hello! Uh, right, so this is a novel... Published in 1719, I'm starting to... <coughs> <laughs> and from what I understand, it is the first, if not one of the first novels written in English. Um, the Spanish did get there a hundred years before, but um, this is England's first novel. Um, and yes, yeah, so it's the story of um, shipwrecked Robinson Crusoe, alone, or is he, uh, on a deserted island in the Caribbean. And yes, it's about how he survives and how he um, uh, gathers resources and stuff. Yes, and believing he is alone until he spots a footprint in the sand. And so is he quite as isolated as he, as he thought he was? Okay, so I can't, I can't say that I knew very much about this novel going in. I did know that there was a, um, a kind of outdated stereotype um, character involved. Um, Friday. I did know. I did know that, but I didn't really know anything else about it. So we're slap bang in the early 18th century. Let's get the obvious stuff out of the way. And what does that mean? Well, that means colonialism, and it means the slave trade. Well, it's tough to get any more obvious than that. And the slave trade features quite prominently in the setup to this book, i.e., in how Robinson Crusoe arrives on the island. So through a set of circumstances, Robinson Crusoe um, is living in Brazil. And he is a plantation owner, growing tobacco and sugar and stuff. And being a plantation owner, that means he is also a slave owner. Uh, and one day, some of the other plantation owners, they come up to him and they say, We've got an idea! Um, buying slaves here in Brazil is very expensive, because you're paying for the shippage. So uh, we've got an idea. We're going to sail ourselves um, across the Atlantic to uh, Guinea in West Africa. We're going to buy slaves there. Uh, cheaper, and then we're going to sail them ourselves over back to here. And Robinson Crusoe is like, what a good idea! It's perfect! Perfect! The blizzard of 52. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so they start to sail off, and then of course there's a hurricane, and they get steered, of course, and there's a big shipwreck on an island, and uh, Crusoe is the only survivor, and so he's there alone on this deserted island. And of course at first he is despairing, uh, then he uh, kind of go goes into survival mode. And finally, um, he gains gratitude um, for his prov providence. And providence is a big old watchword for this novel. So this novel really, the message is that God will provide until the second act turning point. So yes, yeah, so he realises that on the other side of the island, um, sort of native islanders from another island have been bringing prisoners over and killing and eating them, so they're cannibals. Um, and uh, Crusoe is obviously kind of horrified by this. But, you know, this has been happening the whole time! The whole time! He ends up managing to rescue one of these prisoners, uh, who he names Friday. Um, yeah, he becomes a servant to uh, Robinson Crusoe and calls him Master and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so this novel, there is an enjoyment to be had out of this novel. 
um, through the adventure bits and the survival element. Um, the, I mean, the survival element is kind of fascinating. Um, this is an example of kind of realism, a kind of early example, I should say, of, of realism um, as a genre in literature. So that being said, I mean, it is an awkward read, I would say. The worldview, the 18th century worldview and paradigm that uh, Defoe has, and that's, you know, was around back then, is so kind of vividly described and expounded upon throughout the novel that, um, yeah, it, it is an awkward read, and it is in some parts kind of unintentionally comical. I'm not really tempted to kind of sneer at it in a kind of like, oh, this is really problematic, um, because what do you, what do you expect? But, um, but, uh, yes, it's an interesting read. It's, it's, well, yeah, I mean, it, parts of it are fascinating, to be fair. Parts of it are fascinating, and as a sort of historical, um, thing it is interesting with the through line of literature that we get to this and then we get to other things um but uh yes i suppose what defoe is wanting to say is he's wanting to kind of celebrate the ingenuity and the resourcefulness and um and yeah how man how the good christian man is able to um able to survive and how and yeah, celebrate the good, all the good things about human nature. Um, so that was that. But the first book I read in April, um, which is an interesting sort of follow-up to this and a good sort of companion piece to that, is this, Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. And uh, this was published in 1726 and is kind of um, a kind of an answer or an antithesis to Robertson Crusoe. Um, and I like it a lot more. <laughs> so, yeah, so Jonathan Swift, so whereas Defoe has a kind of optimism about humanity and wants to sort of celebrate the good things about humanity, uh, Jonathan Swift is a big old cynic, and um, he's also, well, he's a satiricist, satiricist, and he thinks actually we are all ridiculous and petty and, yeah, we are not as kind of civilizers and and we're not as civilised as we think we are, basically. So Gulliver's Travels, I mean, most people will be familiar with the first, possibly the first two voyages, um, where he's very, very big with the little tiny people crawling over him, uh, and when he's very small with the giants. And each of these voyages, um, he goes to these fantastical lands, which each of them kind of reveals a different facet of human nature that Jonathan Swift wants to poke fun at. So when he arrives at Lilliput with the tiny people crawling all over him, um, Gulliver, yeah, he can sort of look down on these people and he thinks that they're quite petty. It's a sort of totalitarian state of sorts. It's very sort of petty rules. They're having this petty war about with these other people. It's like, it's all very kind of, what are you doing? When he arrives at the, um, the land of the giants, it's interesting that whilst Gulliver um, is kind of, uh, a bit repulsed by their appearance because he can see all their kind of blotches and things close up. Um, they themselves have a similar view of what Gulliver had to the Lily Lilliputians. So yeah, Gulliver kind of tells them about society back home in England and they're kind of abhorred by it. And there's a great quote, if I can find it quickly, I will... I cannot but conclude the bulk of your natives to be the most pernicious race of little odious vermin that nature ever suffered to crawl upon the surface of the earth. So, yeah, so that's kind of the the two voyages that people are familiar with. The other two, um, we have the journey to uh, Laputa, which if you are a Studio Ghibli fan, you will recognise, which is a floating uh, city. So this is an island where science has kind of gone, has sort of jumped the shark, and people, in trying to sort of discover new things, people have kind of gotten a lot more ridiculous. Um, and then we get to the last voyage, which is kind of the most, it's not the most exciting, but it is the most kind of, it's kind of one of the most interesting. So we have this place where there is um, a very, very intelligent breed of horses, and then there is a very, very um, uh, primitive and very disgusting group of primates sort of very humanoid primates, um, called the Yahoos. And the horses initially think that Gulliver is one of the Yahoos, um, but then he's able to sort of say, no, I'm not, I'm not like them. But um, uh, he sort of realises that uh, human race is kind of, is kind of like the Yahoos. We're all kind of disgusting and 
capricious and violent and nasty and smelly. So yeah, so I did, I found this really fascinating, really, really fascinating. I really enjoyed it a lot. It's not kind of like the the big adventure story that you might think it is, at least the second half isn't. It's more kind of, it is a, it's a satire and it's more kind of, there's more kind of a philosophical edge to it. I also watched, uh, on YouTube, someone's posted the 90s adapta uh, TV adaptation of it with Ted Danson as Gulliver. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> it's a very good adaptation, I thought. So, uh, so yes, so that's uh, Gulliver's Travels. And it's just interesting, yeah, I was just interested to kind of compare and contrast Robinson Crusoe with Gulliver's Travels. It's just interesting that you have this kind of attempt at realism, um, optimist, uh, you know, we are, you know, at least uh, white Christian people are very, very good. And then you have Gulliver, I mean, you have Jonathan Swift who says, no, we're all... We're all yahoos, we're all just disgusting, nasty, um, arseholes. <laughs> so yeah, I just thought that was interesting. Okay, next up I read Beowulf by Seamus Haney. 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 Uh, yes. So, uh, at the moment there is a there is a documentary on BBC called The Art That Made Us, and um, it's a documentary looking at the history of the British Isles through the art of the British Isles. Um, and when I say art, I mean it kind of covers like everything from art, music, literature, architecture, um, even clothing at some points. Um, and I've really, I really like it. There's some episodes that are better than others, but um, I really like it as a series. Um, and in one of them, they talked about uh, Beowulf, and they kind of spotlighted a newer translation than this, and I wasn't really too keen on that. But I saw, but they did mention this, and I was like, "Ooh, yes, I want to read. I want to read this. I want to read this," um, because Beowulf. I remember when I was uh, when I was a when I was a child. I spoke as a child. No, when I was a child, I when I was a kid, I um, I was really really fascinated by Beowulf, and I had a very um scary. Um, illustrated book, um, which I uh, I googled recently after I read this to sort of remember. And yes, the the drawings in it are very very scary. But yeah, but I hadn't I'd never sort of read the gone to a translation of the original thing. And so here we go. So yes, what? So yeah, so it's a fairly simple story. It's um story of Beowulf who comes over to help this uh, this king. Um, there's this great hall and this monster Grendel um, keeps showing up and killing everyone and so they need someone to kill Grendel and so Beowulf comes over and says I will kill Grendel with my big muscles um, which he does. Uh, then Grendel's mother um, comes along and says you shouldn't have killed my son! She doesn't say that but she comes along and starts eating people as well. So Beowulf goes and uh, uh, fights her at the bottom of a lake um, with his big muscles, and um, and yes, and then way later on when he's an old man he slays a dragon and la da da. So yeah, it's a fairly simple story, um, as you can sort of imagine. One thing that I um, I was surprised by was the was the Christianity element of it, and I don't know why it sort of surprised me, because this is the Middle Ages, um, I think. But uh, yeah, I mean this translation by Seamus Heaney. Yeah, it's it's good. It's like it's it's like simple to read and stuff. Um, there are boring bits. There are so when after he's killed a monster, there's kind of like a protracted bit where they kind of celebrate, um, and they also there is a bit where he kind of explains what he's done again. You know. So yeah, so some of it is boring, but um, a lot of it is is really interesting, and it's certainly interesting. Um, uh, as a poem, and this translation is, is really, really good. So, yes, I'm glad I read it. What? And that's another thing that a lot of people um, make reference to the first word um, and how translators translate what. Um, and some people have translated it as attend or um, behold or listen. L listen, this is the thing. Whereas Seamus Heaney has said so, so, which is kind of interesting. And in that newer translation, they were spotlighting um, it was bro, which I wasn't like. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I'll definitely recommend this. It's, I mean, as the story of Beowulf, it's um, it's pretty good. Still there. 
Okay, so from a middle-aged kind of fantastical um, story about monsters to a very up-to-date uh, story about monsters, uh, I read The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. Oh, ho, ho, ho. This is an 800-page whopper. Um, yes, high-level fantasy. Hello, on Doom Antidote. <laughs> oh, pink dragons and stuff. Yes, it's not often I read uh, genre fiction as kind of a genre -y as as this. Um, this is a great cover, isn't it? And yes, this is high-level fantasy. This is medieval aesthetic dragons and, you know, magic and witches and stuff. Um, and, and a lot of it. <laughs> so what we've got, so this is basically set in a world where there is... Uh, two big continents, and they both have differing opinions about dragons. So the West, um, they hate dragons a lot. Um, and th there's two types of dragons. In the West, the dragons are fire-breathing, and they, they got bat wings and stuff. And uh, so the Western people have um, uh, really despised them, and they hate them, and their religion is based about um, not liking dragons because they're fire-breathing and horrible. On the eastern continent, uh, these people worship dragons, and these dragons are water-based, and they don't have wings, but they can fly around in the air. Um, and yes, and they sort of venerate them and, and worship them. Um, however, both continents uh, are in fear of this uh, big, big dragon called the Nameless One, uh, who has uh, lain dormant for a thousand years, and it is prophesied that soon he will rise again. And so, uh, yes, there is kind of differing opinions about how to deal with the nameless one. And uh, and so, yes, yeah, so it's about these two um, continents, different people in these continents, um, trying to sort of work how there's going to be a unite uniting force against the nameless one, basically. And uh, among the characters, I mean, there is what I think the kids say is a sapphic romance. Um, so there's the on the western continent there's this queen called queen sabran i think who um slowly starts to develop feelings and form a relationship with eid who is a um who is one of her maids or is she and then on the other cover on, on the other continent you have uh, tane who is who really wants to be a dragon rider but then uh things happen where she has to sort of be exiled and stuff um so yes, so I did find it really enjoyable. I did find it very, very enjoyable. It is long, um, but I think uh, enough happens uh, within it to justify its length. Um, yes, I, I liked it. I liked that it was... Um, uh, I liked all the kind of world-building stuff. I liked the fact that there was two different religions and under and then sort of slowly undermining... Okay, oh, wh where have these religions started from and is that actually correct and stuff so i liked all that i liked the um character development of some of the characters um i liked the suffolk romance <laughs> between Eid and sabran um and yeah i just thought it was really well really well done for the most part i will say i mean i've heard other people say this that um it's a book about build-up it's not really a book about the final battle the final battle takes a well I don't want to spoil anything, but the final battle is, like, here. <laughs> or maybe even here, and so you have this massive thing of build-up to seeing the Nameless One and stuff, and so when it finally happens, it's like, oh, okay. But, um, but no, I did I did enjoy it. And as, uh, my first sort of foray into, um, into, fant into the fantasy genre, um, it wasn't a bad one, I don't think. Um, so... Yes. The marketing, um, they liked to market it as a feminist Lord of the Rings. Um, and, I mean, yeah, yeah, sort of. Um, I mean, it's definitely a feminist story. I mean, it's, you know, female-led and, you know, lots of complicated female characters and stuff. Um, we don't have, dare I say it, a Mary Sue character. You know, they are complicated and flawed and stuff. Whilst they are, I mean, Eid especially, I mean, she's a warrior and, uh, you know... <laughs> What this is, um, and able to sort of uh, you know battle and stuff, but she's not, but she's still flawed and makes mistakes and stuff, so that's cool. And yes, I mean, there's um, if we're talking about representation, there's uh, you know, you've got lesbian representation, and um, there's different a variety of different skin tones with the protagonist, so um, so that's all well and good. Um, and yeah, no, I enjoyed it and I liked it. Yes, it is a long one, but um. You know, it's not uh, 
It's not um, demanding, it's not too demanding. But it's certainly a break from all the dirgy stuff that I usually read, so there we go. Okay, next. So we are continuing with our journey through In Search of Lost Flipping Time, or A la recherche de temps flipping perdu, as the French call it. And we are now on volume two, Within a Bite a Grove. No, Within a Budding Grove. Okay, so we start where we left off in the first book with Marcel. <laughs> <laughs> with Marcel uh, and Gilbert uh, forming this kind of charged friendship um, and Marcel uh, sort of falling in love with her and Gilbert um, not really sort of playing hot and cold, doing a bit of Katy Perry with him. So we're dealing with adolescence and we're dealing with this theme of um, female idolising, um, idolising relationships, idolising women. And as my friend who I'm budding reading this with, um, he puts it, it's kind of like expectations versus reality. It's the the image that you have in your head about how something's going to go, the relationship you're, you're going to have and what happens in reality. But uh, but yeah, so I was I was struck by the kind of the, the different idolising that Marcel does with different women. Um, so you have Gilbert. So yeah, he thinks he's in love with Gilbert and he sort of imagines all this sort of stuff. Um, he also idolises Gilbert's mother, Madame Swan, um, and even when they sort of have a, him and Gilbert have a falling out, he still goes over to the house to hang out with Madame Swan, because he's sort of a, um, not obsessed with her, but he's kind of fascinated and enthralled by her. And yes, that's sort of what happens in the first half. In the second half, um, we go to Balbec, which is a seaside town. He goes there with his grandmother to spend the summer, and uh, there he sees a gang of uh, of young girls, of young women, the same age as him. And uh, yeah, he starts to become enthralled by them um, and tries to find ways in which he can uh, join their group. And yeah, and basically the 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 leader of this of this uh, group is Albertine, and Marcel's got the hots for her. Or, he's got the hots for her, although he he kind of does this. Um, thing where he kind of goes between the girls. He's like, oh, maybe I fancy her. No, I think I fancy her. Oh, no, no, but she's doing that. Oh, I fancy her. Um, and yet each of them kind of falls short to his expectations of where of where he thinks things are going to go. So within a budding grove, this is not a direct translation of the original. The original is something like in the shadow of young girls in bloom or something, in the shadow of young girls in flower. Um, and in the second half, I mean, that's kind of what the deal is. He's kind of, he's uh, enthralled by all these young women who he's, you know, he keeps thinking that he's in love with one of them and then the other one and whatever. And so, yes, and we're dealing with adolescence and we're dealing with um, these feelings, feelings uh, below the belt and stuff. There's a very funny, um, well, there's the most literary description of, uh, of having a semi that I've ever read in this book, which you can look forward to. So yeah, so I have to say that I really enjoyed this one. I enjoyed it more than Swan's Way because I think I'd finally got into a rhythm of reading this book. Um, it is very, very dense. It is difficult. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. It is difficult, um, but I found a way of reading it and a time to read it um, which sort of suited me and which allowed me to sort of enjoy it more. So I sort of, um, basically I read 10 pages at a time and I read I read them at night, um, so before I go to bed, and I'll read 10 pages and then have a bit of a break and then if I want another 10 pages. Um, and that seems to suit me well, um, because it is difficult. And this translation, this is the Moncrief translation with Kill Martin extras. Um, and so my friend who I'm buddy reading, this, buddy reading this with, he's reading it in the original French, because of course he is, um, and I told him that I was reading it reading the Moncrief version, and he said something really fascinating to me. He said, um, I tried that, but it, it was like he writes the characters as if they're Edwardian English people. And suddenly the penny dropped, and I was like, yes, that is exactly, that exactly, that is exactly what it feels like. It feels like these are English, these are English people, Edwardian English people, when it's not, they are French people. And that kind of, it just, the penny dropped because there is kind of a, a looseness to these characters 
which, um, if you think of them as English, doesn't really make sense. But, of course, these aren't English people. They're French people. They're Parisians. And a lot of them are kind of bohemian kind of uh, Parisians as well. And so that makes their behaviour and their actions a lot more kind of... <laughs> when, you, when you remember that, it kind of makes their behaviour and actions um, understandable, you know. Um, but with this translation, because he has this habit of making it seem like it's... Edwardian English people, it just sometimes it sort of throws you off, throws you off a little bit. Um, and I've read, I've read sort of some reviews of the translation, and people say that it is very flowery and just very very dense. And it is, it's very very flowery, um, and you know very kind of like, uh, um, what was the word someone used on BookTube? Someone decadent. They called it decadent. Um, and that's certainly, yeah, that's a that's a good way to describe it. Um, but although, you know, I've had those sort of, not issues, but although I've sort of noticed that, I am going to stick with this translation because, um, yeah, I, I, I do find it, I do find it interesting and I am enjoying it now that I have a rhythm. Um, and of course, next we have um, The Guermont Way, which is volume three. Um, I'm buying these secondhand, um, the vintage... Um, publications and I was a bit annoyed when this turned up because I don't really like this I don't really like this cover to be honest with you but um yes apparently this is a bit longer and apparently this is a little bit more difficult this is like the most difficult one in the series so I'm a bit nervous I'm a bit nervous but uh yes we shall see what happens so yes no I am I am enjoying my journey with Proust um and and yeah and this was I I did enjoy this Marcel is a character, he's a bit despicable, he's a bit, um, yeah, he is a bit despicable and not particularly likeable, but, um, but yeah. Also, there is a character called Charlou, who we met in Swan's Way, and he, he is this kind of, um, he's obviously homosexual, and he's kind of like, ooh la da da and we re-meet him in this, and he's slightly older, and this character, it's one of the most, it's one of the most brilliant descriptions uh, or portrayals of a closeted homosexual that I've read. Um, yeah, ha the way that Proust is able to just um, encapsulate this character and, yeah, just this really kind of embittered and sarcastic um, and, yeah, kind of you, you have to sort of walk around on eggshells so you don't know what he's going to be like from second to second. Yeah, just this a, an amazing representation of a closeted homosexual. Um, and it's really quite sad because he's quite a character in the in the first book, and then in this one he's kind of grown up and he's much more kind of you know he's very very cynical towards youth and stuff. But obviously he's jealous, and it's just yeah he's just a fabulous character and written like really really well. And that's kind of the thing about Bruce is that he's he does pin characters down and their psychology um, in a very astute and adroit way. So here we go. Okay, next we have a women's prize for fiction long list book. We have Build Your House Around My Body Yaddy Yaddy by Violet Coopersmith. Uh, right, so this was long listed for the women's prize. It was not shortlisted. Um, we now know what the shortlist is, and here is my reaction to the shortlist being announced. <laughs> oh, okay. Ah. Oh, good. Yes, yes, yes. This and Great Circle were the only two that I was really hoping for. Oh, yes, okay. Mm. What's this? Ah, oh, okay. Okay, so I've read three of them. Weird, weird, and ghosts. Okay. Oh, body, build your house around my body. I would personally put that in front of Book of Form and Emptiness, but um, Book of Form and Emptiness, it does some interesting things structurally and there's some there's a meta element to it. Um, so that makes sense. And I haven't read the sentence, which is also a ghosty thing, so we'll have to wait and see. Um... Well, I've heard good things about Sorrow and Bliss and the bread the devil needs, so, um, yes. No, I'm, I'm happy with that, the short list. So there. So, yeah, so I'm... 
I mean, I'll, I'll get to the long list later, but um, I'm surprised this didn't make the short list. So this book is wild. Um, so we have two women, two young women in Vietnam um, who go missing um, sort of decades apart. Um, but uh, the way they go missing, uh, they are linked uh, by these two brothers. Um, and uh, yes, it's it's a mystery novel. It's a ghost story. There's bits which incorporate kind of body horror, and there's also sections which wouldn't be out of place in a millennial fiction novel, in that you know you have these kind of really sort of mundane, sort of bad hookup dating bits and kind of you know terrible office parties and stuff. Um, but surrounding that are these really intense um, ghost, scary ghost bits, which are very kind of like ah. So yeah, it's a novel that's steeped in Vietnamese uh, folklore and, uh, I guess, mythology. So the way it's structured is interesting. So it's it, it's structured around the disappearance of Winnie in 2010. Um, and each of the chapters, it kind of goes back and forwards in time. And each of the chapters are kind of pre-headed by six months before the disappearance, you know, five years before the disappearance, a day after the disappearance, it's it's like that, and it kind of goes all over the place. And um, you see all these kind of disparate characters who, um, yeah, at first seem disparate, but then as the novel progresses you see how they all kind of intermingle and, and kind of how, and yeah, and how these two people uh, disappeared and kind of the reasons behind it. Behind it. And uh, yes, there's kind of nasty smoke, there's um, snake-jawed people. All that being said, I mean, I did have mixed feelings about this book. Um, there were bits of it where I kind of lost interest a little bit. I mean, the thing, the things that really worked for me were the the ghostly bits, the kind of the, the, the nasty bits. There was a lot of detail. It's not a long novel. Um, it's under 400 pages, but it does feel... There's bits of it that feel kind of overly descriptive or feel kind of overly expounded upon. There's, I don't know. It's just bits of it so I wasn't like, mm, okay, come on. Um, but uh, but no, I, I did I did enjoy it, and I was I was like, ooh, I certainly enjoyed it more than than some of the other um, Women Prize for Fiction longest books that I've read. So yes, yeah, so that's why I'm kind of surprised that it didn't make the shortlist over some of the others. But all that being aside. Um, I would definitely recommend it because it is um, it is weird. It's wild. Um, um, I mean, the structure of it is, for me, it sort of works, sort of didn't. I don't know. Um, but really, it's a story about revenge um, and kind of uh, and dealing with trauma. Yeah. Whilst I did, there were some bits which I wasn't so keen on. I did think overall it was a very very good novel, but, and it's a debut as well, which is amazing. Um, which leaves us to the shortlist. Um, so, yeah, so I am surprised that that didn't make the shortlist. I mean, I've only read, I've read three of them of the shortlist, and I've got, I'm going to, I've got two of the other ones reserved at the library, so I'll be reading them next month. Um, and I might get around to the third as well, who knows. Um, but yeah, no, I think it is a strong short shortlist. I wasn't sort of unhappy with it at all. Um, I think... It's weird that the Book of Form of Emptimus and Island of Missing Trees are there together, because although Book of Form of, um, although they are two very very different novels, they do share similarities. They're both about teenagers dealing with the loss of a parent a year prior, and they both have non-human narrators. Um, and that's kind of where the <laughs> similarities stop. But it is kind of enough for me to go, oh, you chose both of them. I guess Book of Form of Emptiness. Form and emptiness has a kind of meta element. It's doing something interesting structurally, um, but yeah. But no, I'm surprised that that's that that's there. Um, and having read this, that this isn't there. But um, yes, we shall see. I'm going to read the other. I'm going to try and get around to the other three and see what happens. And um, yes, the winner is announced on June fifteenth, I think. So we shall see what happens. But I think at the moment of the three that I've read. My favourites to win is Great Circle, uh, then Island of Missing Trees, I think that's going to win it, um, and Book of Form of Empty Mist. I mean, I am not, wasn't a huge fan of that one, to be honest. Um, so yes, there we go. And lastly, um, I finished 
uh, this whopper, The Decameron, by Giovanni Boccaccio. The Decameron. So yeah, this is a book that I was sort of eager to get to this year, um, in terms of the classic books that I'm wanting to get to this year. So yeah, so this is um, kind of the, the middle stone between Dante's Divine Comedy and then Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. This sort of sits in the middle. Um, so yeah, so with Dante you have the Divine Comedy, and uh, this is the Human Comedy, um, which then later kind of inspires Chaucer to do a similar thing later on. So the basic premise is that you have you have ten Florentines, young Florentines, and this is uh, right within the Black Death happening. Um, summer of 1348, so the Black Death is rampaging round. Um, and incidentally, there is a prologue to this uh, book, an author's prologue, where he talks about the Black Death, and it is fascinating to read about the Black Death and kind of the, um, yeah, just how sort of scary it was. And I mean, in the book, he says that it, if you got it, then it was three days, you had three days. Um, on the internet, on the wide internet, it says that you had a week, basically. But still, I mean, it's just like, it was a really horrible death and it was just um, very easy to get. It's just, yeah, um, it just must have been absolutely terrifying. And it's very interesting in that prologue because he talks about the di ways, he talks about the ways different people coped with it and how some people were very laissez-faire and sort of like, wow, oh, I don't care, blah, 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 and how other people were just absolutely, obviously terrified. And obviously that does, that has sort of resonance to, um, to recent events, isn't it? But the main bulk of the thing is you have these ten young Florentines who decide they are going to go into lockdown, um, they're going to escape the city and uh, spend ten days in lockdown um, in these in these sort of very lavish country homes of theirs. And so they go and they stay in these very nice homes um, and they, to pass the time, they tell stories to each other. And so over ten days they tell, they each tell a story, and so yeah, the book is basically that, essentially, and it's a book made of a hundred stories. These stories are <laughs> all kind of uh, licentious and offensive and sexy and uh, kind of like, oh, shocking, and yeah, they're kind of, they're all very wild. So yeah, it's mostly kind of comic stories about um, adulterous people or um, you know, men trying to get in bed with certain women and the tactics they use or whatever. Um, some of them aren't about sex, some of them are about other things, but mostly it is about sex. And with a hundred stories, I mean, some of them are more interesting than others. And, uh, yeah, and some are kind of, you know, some of them are funny and some of them are not funny. Some are offensive and some are kind of just, you know, la la la. Um, but yes, no, it is fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. So one story, I guess I'm biased, but there's one story which I really liked, which is there's this gay man who um, obviously doesn't want people to know that he's gay, so he marries this woman, um, thinking that's fine, and he sort of goes off and sleeps with men and stuff. And obviously the wife is really kind of upset at this, She's because she's, you know, she wants... She wants some. She wants a bit of something, something from her husband, and he's not able to give it to her. Um, and she's like, "Right, well, I'm gonna go and have affairs too." So she does. Um, until one day, she's at home with this lover, and her husband comes back home unexpectedly. And there's a few things that happen involving a donkey, but essentially, he he finds out that she's been um, having lovers, and <laughs> initially, he's like, "Excuse me," um, but then she's like. Excuse me! And he's like, oh, okay. And so to kind of, uh, to sort it out, they both sleep with this guy. And, uh, yeah, there's a very funny thing where in the morning this this guy is sort of walking down the street not really knowing what's happened. It's just very, very funny. It also has a phrase which I am never going to forget. Um, there's one story where this, um, this young woman, she is very, very eager, uh, whereas the man isn't. Um, yeah, he, she sort of uh, tires him out, and eventually it says, it's like throwing a bean into the mouth of a lion. Isn't that fabulous? 
I will say that uh, if you've read sort of 20 of them, then you've kind of read them all, or you kind of got the gist for them all. Um, I was sort of starting to lose interest. I mean, by, I got to the eighth day and I was starting to lose interest. Um, but uh, but no, it is, it's very interesting. I mean, I think there is, if you can find a um, an edition which has sort of selected stories, I think that that's fine because you don't need to read all of them. Because um, they are very, very derivative of each other. But um, but it was definitely fascinating. I mean, the prologue particularly is very fascinating. has a fascinating resonance. Um, but yeah, no. I mean, this is bawdy, licentious, offensive, and uh, kind of... Oh! Uh, fun, <laughs> for the most part. So yes. So there we go. So yes, that's the seven books that I read in April. Uh, coming up in May... Uh, I want to read Song of Solomon. I want to read this interesting narrative of uh, Equan e Equiano. Um, that's another one that I picked up from The Art of the Maidus. Uh, 1980 Flipping Four and then The Gear Mont Way, although I think I'm going to take two months to read that. So, yes. So before I do go away, I do want to do some shout-outs. Um, I think I might take you into the other room to do that because I don't want to sit on the floor anymore. So here we go. Okay, so uh, some shout outs. So, um, first shout out I want to do is um, for Modern Azuma. Uh, Modern Azuma, I've, we've kind of interacted with each other for a while now. She, her videos, if you look up calming videos, calming booktube videos in the dictionary, then you get Modern Azuma come up. Her, her video, she does these vlogs and they're just very, very relaxing. She's got a great sense of humour. And she reads kind of similar things to me and has sort of similar op opinions to them. And uh, yes, I'm just, yeah, I really, really love, I love her channel. And she definitely deserves more subscribers. Um, another one is uh, Alana Estelle. Alana Estelle, so she um, she reads classic books. Um, she, does, she reads a lot of classic books. And recently she's been doing these single book reviews. And she did a sort of a 30-minute... Uh, video recently on Swan's Way, um, the first book of In Such a Lost Time, and uh, yeah, it was just, uh, I was just so kind of like, I, I really enjoyed that video, and I was just like, this is amazing, she did one, she also did one on Dracula, which I thought was really cool, so yeah, she's just really, if you like classic books, um, and you like kind of in-depth, insightful, um, but but still sort of entertaining, um, uh, reviews, then uh, then yes, check her out. Um, another channel is Low Shelf Esteem, <laughs> uh, which is just perfect booktube channel, if ever I heard one. Um, so she, um, recently she's been going through the International Booker Prize, and I haven't really, I've sort of, I haven't really been focusing on that one this year, but I've been interested to read, or to watch um, people's opinions about the books. Um, and also she picked up what you can see from here by Mariana Lecky. And anyone who picks that up gets an immediate shout out from me because I want everyone to read that book. Um, so yeah. Um, and then also, I mean, uh, Larry has opinions. Larry has opinions. So Larry has opinions. He's, he's nearly, at the time of recording this, he nearly has a thousand subscribers. Um, but he definitely deserves more than that. Um, what he can't do with a green screen is no one's business. Um, yeah, he's kind of, um, as many people are in this little suburb of Booktube, he's, um, a little bit off-centre and a bit bonkers, uh, like, uh, like some of us, and, um, and yeah, he's had a bit of a break, I was very glad to see that he came back, uh, with a video recently, so yes, have a look at him, have a look at him, um, and lastly, uh, talking about my suburb of Booktube, um, Charlie Heathcote. I just want to shout out Charlie Heathcote because he's been a sort of staple of booktube for a while and I've kind of... I don't know if this is weird to say, but whenever his videos crop up, there's always sort of like a comforting... There's something quite comforting in seeing another Charlie Heathcote video pop up. <laughs> um, and he reads sort of similar books to me and I'm always sort of interested to see what his opinions about, about them are. Like, so particularly the Women's Prize. Like, I'm always interested to see his opinions about about them um because sometimes they we agree and sometimes we don't but i'm just interested to see what he what he thinks um and he's an author himself 
Um, so yeah, so check out his channel. So yes, so yeah, I'm very, very grateful. So 3,000 subscribers is ridiculous. Um, and I'm very, very grateful to anyone who's been uh, following along, along the way. And um, yes, so I shall probably see you uh, next, next month. So yes, I hope you're all okay, and I shall see you very soon. Bye-bye. Hehehe. <laughs>